Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. science. I, this may be a little too off topic, but I'm going to go there anyway. Well, we've already been talking about sharks and <laughs> mostly raccoons for the whole. Well, episode. I'm going to venture into the <laughs> land of speculation for a minute, and, and Mike, you know, feel no obligation to go there with me if you don't want to. But <laughs> we we've been talking a lot, Marcus, uh, not only on our show but on some other ep- ep- shows that we've been on recently about you know how are we potentially influencing turkeys through baiting and feeding, right? Mm-hmm. And it just it. When, when Mike said that about these raccoons targeting these crayfish, which are, you know, only there's a few feet of elevation change, mm-hmm. but that puts them in areas that are outside of, you know, primary areas that turkeys are selecting for. It just makes me think about you've got that spatial segregation of food sources. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we put, you know, like a, like a corn pile in an upland area, well, then you're shifting, you're, yeah, you're doing away with that spatial segregation of food sources. And well, that's a that good raccoon point because you, you would also put it in the dry place because you don't want right. corn on in the wet. Right. Yeah. So it just makes me think about how there's certain practices that we might do that that change, you know, what otherwise would be two spatially segregated species, at least in certain systems. Yeah. yeah that, that sounds like a testable study we could do. Yeah. I think it's <laughs> something that would be really useful to know because – like you, you pointed out, this is, you know, we typically, like if you ask somebody what a nest predator, the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth is raccoon. You don't even have to name the bird species. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you just, you know, like a, the raccoons are just known to be that. And uh, yep. I think that that definitely is a really interesting thought. Yeah. Poor raccoons, they get so much. <laughs> I don't remember, buddy. I so, think it's overblown. So, <laughs> it's sad because I love raccoons. I think they're <laughs> cool as hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are really interesting. And I, I actually got to be around one when I was a kid. It was a pet. Of course. <laughs> everybody has somebody. <laughs> everybody knows that guy. You know, that had a pet raccoon. Uh, this is some more Alabama stuff coming out right here. This is, yeah, the Alabama's coming out. <laughs> I was saying, it was starting to sound like a Florida man story. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I haven't. I don't have any Florida man stories yet. I'm sure I'll get some, but I grew up in Alabama, so I have plenty of those. Uh, but that that was one of the most clever yeah. animals I've ever been around. It was just so intelligent, and and uh, I, I've grown to really respect them because yeah. they're really good at being raccoons. I mean, they're yeah, just, I mean, like, they can survive anywhere too. Like yeah. they're kind of, I mean, sort of like turkeys. There's kind of, you know, they're both pretty generalist. There's, there's kind of mm-hmm. some, uh, what's the word? Not connection parallels between yeah. You know, yeah. those species, you know, very generalist. I say the same thing with coy- coyotes, right? They can live in urban areas. They can live in agricultural areas, pine forests, mm-hmm. bottomland forests marshes right yeah yeah i mean gotta, I'm, gotta, the same, gotta respect it. I'm the same way with coyotes mike you know, from, the, from the work from the work that i've done with them you know it's i've, I've only grown to respect them and a lot of times i'll say, you know you say that every now and then around hunters and they look at you like you have two heads but i mean well you gotta just appreciate like they're just really good at being yeah what they are you know i thought you were yeah, gonna we, say that you live everywhere <laughs> like you're really <laughs> adaptable <laughs> I mean, we've kind of created the perfect world for them. We got rid of all the other predators. We've altered the landscape. We've kind of mm-hmm. hard to get mad at them, but we've kind of made it perfect for them. You know, right? So, yeah, right. Well, can you tell us some about the work that you've got going on now in Missouri? I can. Um, so, like I was saying, we, we're not super big on results yet. So it is very much a work in progress. We're just finishing up year uh, three of four for field seasons. Um, 
with many, many, many terabytes and hard drives of data that need to be analyzed. But we're gonna work up in North Missouri, Putnam County, if anyone's listening from, from up there, you probably are aware of our presence and my grad students. Um, so this is a part of the state that um, had seen some of the biggest declines in uh, like full per hen ratios and, mm -hmm. and apparent population decline. So that's kind of a justification for, for working up in that part of the state. Uh, and the big question is, we're you zoom back, what we're really trying to do is isolate like what are the factors that actually influence uh, reproductive success, both nesting success and then uh, brood survival afterwards. Um, so we're kind of taking a, a big ecosystem approach to this. Um, so we're doing the things where we put GPS trackers on the females like, like you do. Um, but we are you know, along with the normal nest stuff that you do, and um, you've probably covered this in other podcasts where you find the nest and you track nest success and you, you kind of look at nesting habitat. We're also trying to get at uh, weather. So we've got weather stations all over the study area. Um, you know, so we can say how much it rained on this day at this spot, you know. Um, so all that through the reproductive season, um, we are doing mark recapture of uh, raccoons and possums to try to get at population sizes and population density in different habitats. We are um, putting up game camera arrays during the brood rearing season um, so we can get at um, occupancy and habitat of potential brood predators um, to use as a covariate for brood habitat selection. So I guess let me back up a little bit there. So like I said, we're we're trying to look at all the different factors. So for, for the nesting part of it, we're looking at weather at a fine scale. We're looking at density of the raccoons that everyone uh, hates, uh, along with, with possums. And we're trying to do skunks as well, just we're not catching a lot of skunks to really get much of a number there. So we're kind of doing that across the county, um, kind of with the goal of like, okay, if, if we know these relationships and we have a nest here, we can sort of estimate the density of raccoons that would expect it to be within you know, X meters of, of that nest site. Um, so predator density, weather, the, the GPS units we're using are, are these, these German company called EOBS, which I think a lot of people have switched to recently. And they have these accelerometers in them, which is like if you have a Fitbit or your, your watch tracks your steps, kind of that same kind of technology. And uh, before the project, well, what we can use these for is every Every two minutes, they're kind of turning on for a little bit, and they're tracking that that X Y Z accelerometry. Um, so, for the nesting part of this, we can get very high resolution um, when the females are recessing from the nest and how long they're staying off the nest. Um, and so, for the first year of some of these tags, we also have it set up so when they get off the nest, we get ten GPS locations every minute until they sit back down. Um, oh, wow. So we have the weather, we've got the predator aspect, we've got the behavior of the females, which a lot of research now is, is showing to be, that might potentially be one of the most important aspects. It's just some females just know how to do it, and some mm. females are not as good at it. Mm -hmm. So we have that, um, along with you know, the standard vegetation stuff and the landscape habitat to get at what tease those apart and figure out, okay, what what actually is the thing that predicts nest survival? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are going to be some really interesting results that I'll look forward to to hearing back from you on and, or seeing it when it's published because, you know, um, Coulter Chitwood and several of his colleagues at Oklahoma State, that they just got done. I, I don't know if you saw their recent publication, but they were looking at a variety of factors that influence turkey vital rates. And as part of that, they were looking at um, studies of nest success, factors affecting nest success, and then brood survival. Mm -hmm. And I think there was like nearly 100 studies that reported some aspect of nest success, but there was a small fraction of that that even tried to look into any of the factors that were driving nest success. And then when you get down to brood survival, I mean, I'm sure you're well aware, we have almost no published studies <laughs> no, on brood yeah. survival. And so you, you guys are also tagging poults as part of that, right? 
Yeah. So I was going to get to the, the bolt part of it. So yeah. So we're 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 tagging the bolts when when they hatch, trying to get them within two days. Capture the bolts, put a little VHF transmitter on them, and let them go. Um, which we were really bad at the first year, but we've since gotten much better at. Oh, it's, a, it's a funny. You read like th there's not many studies that have ever done it, but if you read like the Hubbard study, which is like the one I can think of where they did in the wild, the methods is just like. Uh, we walked in on the female in the morning and just hand captured the birds. And right. so it is not that easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first year I did it, I was up with one of my grad students and I went out in the morning with her and we had penned down the female. We could tell with the transmitters that, okay, like, imagine she's in the middle of us. My, my grad student is five to 10 meters on one side and I'm like five, 10 meters on the other side. And we're like, all right, she's right there. We, you know, she's, she's got a brood. We can't see her. She's nesting on roosting on the ground under like some, some dense shrubs. And so it gets light. We walk in a little bit and she flushes straight up. And we're like, all right, that's where the bolts are. We couldn't find the bolts. <laughs> just, could, just could not find them. And then like the shrubby cover, it was just like, okay, we, we're going to like stop before we step on these things that have to be here. Yeah. Um, we got yeah. better the second year. We, we wound up getting a handheld like thermal imager and that oh, yeah. has made all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you what, uh, what did you learn that allowed you to get better at it? Yeah, so. it was, it's thermal, thermal imager coming in really early in the morning and getting the a beat on like, okay, there's, there's the hen. And then when the, when she spooks off with thermal imager, you've got a better shot at picking up the signatures. Okay. That's where the bolts are. That's, yeah. that is immensely improved <laughs> success in that regard. Yeah. So are y'all, um, are y'all still trying to just grab them by hand? Or are you trying to use like a little like temporary fence system around them or anything like that? Uh, we just grab them by hand. Okay. I mean, the landscape we're in, like I know, like for quail, sometimes they do that temporary fence. It's just yeah. it would be, it's just not feasible with the yeah. trees and the shrubs. Just too much right. vegetation. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so then what we're trying to do is, is once we get that, so we're going to have a whole bunch of females every year that just don't have a brood. We've got a bunch of broods that we're tracking, so we can look at individual poult survival. Sometimes get it cause mortality. Although a lot of times it's you just find a piece of a carcass or just a yeah. transmitter on the ground or, or they just disappear and it's hard to say exactly why mm. they disappeared. Mm. But um, along with that, again, to get the cause of like, okay, what is the thing that actually influences pulse survival? Um, we've got sort of a bunch of complicated stuff going on. So we've got... Um, the weather stations I talked about, they're, they're going throughout the season. And then we've also got at like 50 different locations kind of spread throughout the county. We've got um, these little like temperature logger, loggers, um, this thing called hobo loggers. Um, so we've got these kind of like permanent vegetation points where we've got one of these loggers at about ground level where a bolt would be to get at um, thermal conditions. So it's like taking temperature every 10 minutes. Um, at each of these sites, every two weeks, we go to these sites and we do a vegetation survey. And then we also do arthropod studies to get at forage availability. So we've kind of got a, a leaf blower modified as a leaf sucker that we've used to, to sample uh, I've used insects those, at ground level. Um, I've used those and, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we've also got arrays of, of game cameras to get at um, occupancy of potential brood predators, things like boxes, coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, whatever the case may be. And the hope is that we can like kind of plot the movement paths of the, the broods um, and we can get at the background um, of these kind of covariates. Um, so we can say, okay, the turkey was here. And based on our results, we'd imagine the vegetation density is this, and the probability of encountering a bobcat in this habitat at this time is this, and the amount of arthropod biomass at this time would expect it to be about this. And so to get into the science side for the audience, we're looking to quantify habitat selection, um, which is basically you, you see where the animals were, and you compare conditions at those sites to kind of a random set of locations where the animal could have been. Mm -hmm. You kind of say, okay, the animal was choosing these sites relative to these sites because of X, Y, Z. And 
if I can get on a soapbox that maybe people won't care about, but I like to get on soapbox now and then, <laughs> uh, with a lot of habitat selection studies. So not just for turkeys, but for for all for a lot of species. The the environmental things we look at are generally very human centric things. They're things we can measure easily, like like land cover, right? Like mm -hmm. pine forest, hardwood forest, open field, right? But but a turkey doesn't go through the landscape and be like, oh, look, that is a patch of pine forest that was harvested 8 to 12 years ago. That's what I like. I like pine forest that was harvested 8 to 12 years ago, right? They're looking for, okay, am I going to overheat? Is there food? Is it safe from predators? Mm -hmm. Right? And so kind of what we're hoping to do here is, is make that the thing that we're actually measuring. That's why we're going through all the work of sucking up the invertebrates and putting out the game cameras and putting out the temperature loggers to kind of get it at those things. So hopefully the inferences we make can maybe be a bit more transferable. Right. So it's yeah. you can see like, okay, uh -huh. they're, 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 they're preferentially using areas with lots of forage availability that are, are cooler than the surrounding landscape. Right. Or, or maybe you could say, okay, the, the ones where we see a lot of pulp loss, those are the ones that are in areas that have higher occupancy probabilities of the predators. And so those were riskier areas. You can kind of, kind of, pull that stuff apart. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of times mm -hmm. in habitat selection studies, we get at the proximate cause of selection and you're taking it to the next step of ultimate. In other words, you know, turkeys, to use your example, maybe selecting for a pine stand that was harvested eight to 12 years ago. And that's as far as most studies measure it. But the reality of it is they're selecting for that stand that was harvested eight to 12 years ago because it has greater, you know, thermoregulation characteristics or more insects or fewer predators or Mm -hmm. yeah exactly the kind of like okay we see what they're using but like why right what we're trying hopefully trying to get out of this yeah and i mean i think that that should help make the results more transferable to other areas as well yeah no, i think that's yeah. really really interesting another thing sort of related to that is we would it you know in that same vein we would be kind of assuming that the vertebrate abundance let's say is uniform in a particular vegetation type, mm -hmm. which is probably not the case either, and certainly not the case with with some of those metrics. Like they're going, there's going to be a high level of variability even within the classifications. Uh, so you're yeah. you're uh, getting at at uh, some of those issues, which are I think is is really cool and interesting. Yep. Uh so come back in another a year or two. Hopefully we'll have some of the <laughs> results from the literal hard drives we are filling up on a daily basis of so all this data. Yeah, I bet. I mean, that's a that's a pretty incredible effort to, to be that comprehensive at that scale. So yeah. uh, one thing you, you said earlier, and I was just curious if, if you have any instinct or maybe you're not ready to talk about it, but you said sometimes you could kind of work out what you thought happened to poults is there something that is the really common cause of mortality that you've been able to identify or is it just like uh, everything wants to everything out there kills a poult or what you know what does that look like it's probably the second one so i i believe we found just a dead poult right like mm -hmm. we were thinking okay maybe if there's disease or something I, I don't think we've just found like oh this poult is dead and there's not much like signs of wear and tear, uh, which is partly good because it means we're not killing bolts with our tagging. Which you know we did a yeah. we did an entire aviary study before this project to learn how to attach transmitters to bolts, so we mm -hmm. avoided that. Um, yeah, that's good. It seems like when we do find the, the cause of mortality, it's usually predation, and I think it just because predation just. It's easier to suss out sometimes because mm -hmm. you'll find like, oh, there's a part of a wing next to this transmitter. Or on a few occasions, we found like, oh, here's a piece of uh, bobcat poop and our transmitter is in the bobcat poop. Like that's yeah, pretty, pretty clear. I think we found one in owl pellet once. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it's easier to that. I don't know if that means that every cause of mortality is predation related. I think there might be a bit of a bias there and just those are the ones that it's easier to detect exactly what happens because uh, sometimes you'll just find a transmitter and then you've got to say, okay is the pulp dead or did it just pull out the transmitter because they're just right. kind of sutured in pretty lightly mm -hmm. so um, yeah and i mean you've also got that issue of the pulp dies from being cold 
you know, another animal comes along opportunistically, they're going to scavenge it. So exactly. You can't differentiate that. Yeah. So it's a lot of caution involved in saying this pulp died because of X reason. I think like the owl pellet and the bobcat scat examples are probably pretty clear cut. Um, but it, I'd use a little bit more caution with the others. Um, like I say, some of the interesting results with the, I don't know if it's interesting, but it's exactly expected, which is nice once in a while is, you know, we kind of plotted out some of the basic survival curves. Um, and once they get to 12, 14 days, that survival skyrockets. Yeah. Right. So as soon as they, a lot of that mortality is happening in those first two weeks. And then as soon as they can get off the ground, they kind of stabilizes considerably. Yeah. Yeah, Which, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, and it also aligns with what we've been saying right. on, on the podcast. So that's good news. Another oh, uh, study seems well, to be confirming. Yeah. Uh, so what one one interesting kind of off the cuff result is we had one case where we can confirm that, and this is another reason you have to be careful with when a pull goes missing, trying to just say what happened to it. So we censor it out instead of assigning a fate. We have one confirmed instance where. Uh, we were tracking, uh, you know, a female and her brood, and one of the brood just went missing. Uh, this happens a lot. We just, oh, it's gone. I don't know what happened to it. Grad student suddenly got a reading on it and went to track in on it, and that pulp had switched to a new hen that was traveling with a whole totally different mm. group of birds. Oh, so wow. it wasn't dead. It had just, you know, maybe those two hens got up and they flocked, and then they went their separate ways, and, and that particular pulp didn't stay with its mom. It went with the other group. So it's kind of curious as to how often that happens with some of our missing tags. We got one yeah. this year we suspect that happened with, but we're not sure. Well, that's a pretty cool observation. Yeah. yeah I'd never, I guess I thought about the hens coming together and just kind of hanging out together, but mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about them breaking up subsequent or, you know, at the, after a couple of days together or whatever. And, and uh, one of the, Holt's going with the other mother is. Yeah. That, <laughs> I mean, as much as, you know, we probably don't want to hear this as turkey hunters. Oftentimes this bird's not very smart. So, and I mean, especially when you see those little several day old poults running around, well, you know, so they're just trying to hop over the next stick, much less worry about who they're following. So, well, let me give you an alternative hypothesis here. Okay. Maybe that poult is very smart. Maybe that was the bad mama. He's like, well, this mama was really good. <laughs> I'm gonna switch. switch maybe here they just got, maybe they got into a fight and just you know they just ran away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's true. I wonder how often that actually happens if we just don't notice it or what the implications of it would be. But it's kind of yeah. interesting. I yeah. mean, the only reason is we could we can confirm it because my grad student like was like, okay, the the mom is nowhere. I'm picking up this pulse transmitter and oh wow, it just uh. Hen with a bunch of poles just walked across that road, and that's where the signal's going from. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that is super interesting. Well, you know, we've talked about some other kind of similar things, like uh, multiple paternity is apparently fairly common, uh, based on yep. at least one of the studies. Out, what was it, California? Mm-hmm. Uh, based Nest on genetics, there. Nest parasitism seems to be pretty common too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the other one I was going to say. Uh, you know, one hen dumping a few eggs and another hen. Nest seems to be fairly common. So, you know, there's a lot of Which things going on. There's some cheaters out there, you know. <laughs> it's a great strategy, though, right? Like, yeah. like think about when is, when is your most risk if you're a female turkey. It's when you're sitting down for 30 days straight. Right. And then yeah. you've got these bunch of little nuggets that can't fly for 14 days after that. Yeah. Well, what if you, what if you just dump a few eggs here and a few eggs there, and now it's everyone else's problem and presumably one of those other nests is a good mom so your genes are going to go on without any risk to you it's yeah kind of makes sense yeah. that's a brilliant strategy obviously uh, uh not all hens could do that or there wouldn't be any nesting yeah. so yeah. <laughs> but you know usually in, in uh population or usually uh there's some cheaters that emerge in the in the mix and these these uh strategies so uh yeah, I never thought about that from the pole standpoint. That's it's pretty a, cool. It sounds like a basic tenet of investing, right? Diversifying your portfolio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that, has, that would probably be the most fit hand because she literally doesn't put all her eggs in one basket, right? right. Yeah, right. Like, like you've got a high likelihood right. of somebody <laughs> pulling off a few of your, your uh, yeah. poles. 
So it's kind of interesting when you think about it. It's like, wow, we've, I've been tracking this hen for two years and she never, never successfully reproduced. And it's like, well, well, maybe she was the most successful, actually. <laughs> well, you actually just yeah. brought up, made me think about it a different way. And maybe this is what you're, what you were saying. I don't, uh, not sure, but we commonly look at nest initiation rates in I was populations ask the of same thing. I know where you're going yeah. with that. Some of those hens might be nest dumping instead of initiating their own nest. Yeah. We wouldn't detect it necessarily. Yeah, that'd be hard to hard to suss out of the GPS data. Yeah, if they only it, especially if they only lay two or three in the nest, you know, they they yeah. could go under the radar. Now, I don't know if there's some hens that would just dump everything and not nest themselves, or if they do. There's probably probably a spectrum of yeah, it's cheating. How much they engage in that, but I mean, it would kind of be brilliant if they initiate their own nest, but they also put a few in everybody else's basket. And if everybody yeah. did both of those, that'd pr- probably be a pretty good strategy, I would think. Yeah. Yep. So you're also in, involved in some really interesting drone work. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you had to think about that one yeah. for a second. Your yeah. pause was like, oh, was this a different I was thing? like, wait, wait, <laughs> that's <laughs> it. I, I have really interesting. I, <laughs> but yeah, okay, I'll go with really interesting. But, um, uh, but yeah, we actually, you know, just recently talked to Jason Harden and he was talking a little bit about um, the drone survey work that you guys are using down there in Texas uh, to try to estimate populations. Is that right? It's a uh, had a grad student down there. We GPS tagged a few birds and a few different spots, and basically we had a drone with thermal imaging camera, and so we kind of run these trends. It's kind of like, okay, we know we go out at night, we download the location where the birds roosting. It's okay, we know we know there's a turkey roosting there, and we can fly a drone over where we know the turkey is. And kind of the original original question was first off like, well, do they even show up? in the thermal imaging and we did a, a pilot study a few years back with Jason where we found that uh, yeah they actually they do show up like you can you can see them when you fly over them and so then we kind of expanded the study a bit um, you know with larger sample size a little bit more habitat diversity and working with the uh, uh, computer science people here at the Mizzou to see if okay but it's really tedious like to just go through the video and try to identify a bird and count it and also it's kind of hard unless you know what you're looking for so see if we can sort of train some uh, machine learning algorithm to sort of automatically identify and try to count uh, birds so i would guess that vultures probably pose the biggest challenge that is a hundred percent true yeah um if if i show you because we did a a few flights over vulture roost that we kind of opportunistically Oh, look, there's some vultures roosting over right. there, so we'll fly over them the exact same way. Um, they're difficult to tell apart. Yeah. Um, they roost a little bit differently based on our sample, like how they're distributed in the tree. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't rely on that totally. Um, so, like me and my grad student, we can kind of tell them apart, but we've just been like staring at these videos for two yeah. years. So we, we kind of know. We would put it up to uh, some other people to tell apart. Uh, you know, identify, we gave people a bunch of small video clips and said, what species is in this video clip? And about 60% chance of someone guessing right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you a fun story. I'll give you the short version of it, but, uh, Oh no, (laughs) I've got a, I've got a student that's currently using drones to survey waterfowl in North Alabama. And she's doing day and night surveys. And of course her night surveys rely on infrared. And several months ago, um, she was just like, Hey, check these out. Brought, you know, brought her laptop down to my office and she picked up a bunch of turkeys on the roost at night. And so it just prompted this idea in my head. I was like, you know, Holy crap. Like this is something that we could potentially use to survey populations and, you know, I know like people here and there and there and there that have tagged birds that we could use to verify it with and everything like that. And so I got all excited about it. And the reason that I knew that vultures were difficult to differentiate is because I'd even started digging into the literature to try to see, you know, what some of the challenges would be with this methodology. Because I was thinking about putting a proposal together. And then I 
figured out that you were already working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so, you, so you scooped me on that one. But, <laughs> Several years ago. <laughs> but I, yeah, but I'm actually glad that you did because, I, you know, I don't get that excited about population estimation type projects. And but I think it's such a, it's a uh, it's a too valuable of a potential resource and a, a method that we can use uh, to for somebody not to be working on that. Yeah, and I mean, it would be a good way. We don't really have a good way of measuring, of getting N, the population size yeah. for Turkey over a large, it just doesn't ex- exist. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, ha- harvest indices, you know, you kind of use the pull for hand ratios or, yeah. or like in Missouri, they've got the bow hunter kind of observations, but they're all proxy indices of abundance and there's lots of biases, mm-hmm. you know, sample biases and effort biases. So it'll be, yeah, my idea was like, wow, this is a way you could just, identify potential roost habitat, survey X percent of it. Yes. It's almost like a distance sampling type of a study. That's exactly that was where my exactly, head was. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That was exactly the the whole just the, where my head was when I thought of that as well. And I could see it working. Um like in the in the more uh west not West Texas, but um like north central part of, of Texas where it's uh, you know kind of north of the hill country where it's much more open and you just have like smaller trees around riparian areas mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and you get turkeys kind of concentrated in these little riparian draws like it, it seems to me like it it's very viable in those types of systems especially because it's probably easier to beforehand figure out where vultures may be in east texas uh, a little bit more challenging pine trees make it a little harder mm-hmm. uh, intermix the, the turkeys are more spread out because there's a lot more roosting habitat available mm-hmm. Vultures are probably harder to suss out. Uh, where I think it would work well is if you go a few states north in the winter, especially where you don't really have vultures as often. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in open habitats with hardwood dominated, I, I think it, it's got some legs where it could potentially be useful. Yeah. I was thinking through that. It, the behavior of the animal is really aligning in several ways for it to be a good, you know, potentially a, a good approach. You know, they're yeah. win, winter flocking. You know, if they're, like you said, if they're relatively concentrated, not only in where they're choosing to roost, but also they're congregated when they do so during that the time that you would most easily detect them. You know, they're yeah, you do it in the winter. Kind of when the roots are off, that was useful. kind of thinking. Was, yeah, we, you have an animal that. Had, some time of the day you know is not moving, so you have to deal with that. Mm-hmm. It's cold, so that should hopefully make it easier to see. And then you have deciduous trees in the winter; they've got leaf off. It kind of seems like, yeah, we got to try this. Like, yeah, this, no, that's a good. Seems like it would work. The, I mean, the hard part is they're not like a deer, right? Like you know, like a a, a deer shows up really obviously on a on a thermal eye. Right. Um, you know, they're they're much smaller, so picking them out is a once you kind of know what you're looking for, they're a little easier to see, but mm-hmm. I think adding the machine learning is probably the way to go to make it more efficient mm-hmm. so someone doesn't lose their eyesight scrubbing through video. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So are, are you using drones for in, uh, other things? So I thought you said you, you were using them for finding nests or something like that as well. Uh, no, just this, this for now. Okay. I think that's really I'm just cool. proud of myself because there was one instance <laughs> where I was thinking on the same plane as Mike Byrne, which yeah. doesn't happen a lot in my life. Well, I can, <laughs> I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shucks. laughs> Got any good, like, Mako Shark ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that tonight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, are, are there any other projects that you have ongoing, or is it mainly that big comprehensive project in Missouri? Uh, the Missouri one is, is, for Turkey at least, the one that's taken up the... So we're, we're wrapping up the, the drone one now. My student's probably going to be defending early part of this next semester, so hopefully mm-hmm. there's some results publishable yeah. out there. In the hopefully nearest future, there'll be a poster at the Wildlife Society this year, if anyone's going to that. Yeah. Um, outside of that, the, this big North Missouri project is uh, it's a big project, so it's kind mm-hmm. of a 
been the main focus, uh, at least for my turkey related stuff. It's kind mm-hmm. of all my energy has been concentrated there for now. Yeah. It sounds like a really cool project. I'm glad to see the, the comprehensive approach, you know, and some unique ideas uh, laid in together with it. Yeah. Hopefully some cool results come out of all this work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My biggest, my biggest fear, and I don't, I don't know if it's a fear, it would just be the result. It would just be like nothing pops out as like the thing that's influencing nest success, which honestly wouldn't surprise me uh, because this stuff is really good. It's eco- I, I, I tell a lot of my students when I teach that like, it's not rocket science, it's ecology. It's much more complicated than yeah. rocket science. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Uh, and I think a lot of people... You know, they want like, okay, the answer is we just kill all the raccoons and then we're going to get like a million turkeys on the landscape. And it's like, right. yeah. nah, it's just not that simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask you related to, to that project. It sounded like you have a whole bunch of places where you're doing tagging turkeys. Are, are, is that on private land? Is that how uh, you're yeah, going? Overwhelmingly or? on private land. It's, uh, yeah. I think the county is like 98% private something like that so there's a there's a few small conservation areas um Mm -hmm. in the county but mostly it's it's all private yeah well i I mean uh, in terms of the range of the easterns at least a large portion of the range is mostly private land so hopefully uh you know if there's anything unique to private versus public land uh you you'll pick up on that yeah it does make it a bit representative, I think, of what most landscapes actually are. You know, we do a lot of studies as biologists on conservation areas and wildlife refugees because it's easy. Yeah. You know, e- easy in terms of access, right? right. Mm-hmm. Not in terms of study design. But I think, yeah. So uh, shout out to all the landowners that are helping us out. If uh, you happen to be listening to this podcast, we very much appreciate being able to work on your land. Yeah. I, I think that you should give credit for sure. I mean, I'm that that's refreshing to hear, you know, uh, that that's, this is what the third project that we've covered on the podcast that are, that are, uh, primarily fourth on private land. So yeah, the Tennessee, North Carolina, Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama, and Missouri. Yeah. So that's really awesome to see the, you know, uh, landowner base getting involved and, and uh, trying to help out so really really cool also helps us cover a a larger area right so we're not constrained to like this conservation area yeah yeah right so do you do you have any males tagged like even if they're just banded or is it all female Uh, no not in this study um we haven't caught very many males Mm -hmm. um a few jakes mixed in with the winter flocks but we haven't really been catching the males i got you they're they're doing uh south southwest Missouri somewhere in the southern part of Missouri MDC is doing a male banding study mm-hmm. that's going on right yeah now. I think we t- didn't we talk about that a little bit mm-hmm. we did that's a episode. hunter harvest related study I believe mm-hmm. yeah was well, there anything else that uh, that you've got going on that you think folks would be interested to hear about or or anything that you'd like to share. Uh, let's see. That other people would be interested in. So, <laughs> that's stuff, that the, that's the stuff that I'm there. interested in. But if other people are interested in, that's <laughs> a big question. Well, we just always like to, you know, give a little bit of time. If there's something you need to, you know, had on your mind that you wanted to get out that we didn't cover yeah. today, or any topic you want to talk about, it would be fine. Even if it's mako sharks. I like mako sharks. <laughs> I, I I could talk. We could do another hour on mako sharks if you want. <laughs> Put this whole proposal together to look at oxygen minimum zones and blue sharks and mako sharks in the Pacific Ocean related to climate change. That was, uh, that was the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of other stuff going on along with the turkey stuff. Some people may or may not find as interesting. We've been uh, doing studies of spotted skunks and gray foxes with camera traps in the Ozarks, trying to get at their distributions there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been doing a lot of work recently in the Great Lakes with grass carp. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure how I got into that, but, you know, invasive species kind of work. So population estimation and life history stuff Um, with that. I was just finishing up a mako shark study, looking at post-release mortality in commercial fisheries. Um, I just even just finished that. Uh, 
you, have a so study you're in India on tigers that's kind of getting started, which is kind of interesting, but also a logistic pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I can <laughs> imagine. Yeah. And so you, yeah. you said a number of things that are, you know, aquatic based studies. Did you originally get into the field for fisheries or? Is that just happenstance? Um, Did you, you know, what, what drew you to be in the field? Sort of happened. I don't want to say happenstance. It's just, I've got, I never really drew that hard line between fish and wildlife. I just, mm-hmm. it's, it's all vertebrates to me, right? It, it's yeah. all animals. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, the, there's a lot of stuff that translates from one to the other. I think one of the benefits of working in both is you can kind of pull some stuff from one field that the other field doesn't use that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Replicable. I'll give you an example. You guys are familiar with known fate survival models, right? Mm -hmm. You probably use them a million times in a million studies. Um, Let's do a mago shark work uh, with the tags that you put on the dorsal fins. Right. And so we're tracking the sharks and the, both New England and the Atlantic coast. And all of a sudden we'd see some of these shark tracks would suddenly make a beeline from the open ocean to like a port in Canada. <laughs> we'd start seeing that a bunch of times. It's like, Oh wait, that is, a, that is obviously a shark that was harvested by a commercial fisherman and got caught. So I was like, Oh, we should like, well, first off, there's a lot of them that are being caught. We should probably try to quantify this. Uh, and so I wound up using just your basic known fate survival model that you use in like a normal deer or a turkey study to get at fishing mortality rate. And just that, that had never been done on a shark or any oh, wow. like pelagic fish species. Yeah. I brought it up in a meeting. I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. Like, you know, in the wildlife world, oh, that's a thing we see all the time. And in the large pelagic fish world, it just wasn't there. So you kind of borrow across, right? Some of the, some of the analyses I used for my raccoons in my PhD was analyses that I borrowed from people that were studying like seabirds like albatross and stuff mm-hmm. like that so. super cool yeah. Yeah. well I, i've definitely i'm not as diverse as what what you're doing i've worked on various things and multiple systems and i have found a lot of value in that because of the cross-pollination of ideas and uh yeah. it's interesting to hear you say that and give an example do you have any that go the other way where you use something from the deep sea if uh make a short work or something that you've applied to turkeys no not yet it's uh the analysis of the marine stuff is a lot more challenging and so it's it's more a case of okay how can i adopt the stuff from the terrestrial world to apply it to the mm-hmm. marine stuff where there's yeah. a lot more moving parts and you don't have much control over the data um, I mean, except for the, you know, the albatross type analyses being applied to the raccoons, it's kind of, it going the other way mm-hmm. to some degree. But yeah, I think it's just interesting to work on a lot of different stuff. It just keeps it a bit fresh for me and keeps me having to read a lot of stuff. And I mean, honestly, once, once you get some of the basics of, you know, the ecology theory behind some methods, it, it really applies across anything. I mean, like once you know, what a home range is biologically and kind of how to estimate it from different things. You can do it from a snake, a turkey, a raccoon, a deer, or an albatross, right? Like, mm-hmm. And I just like catching uh, lots of different types of critters. And, uh, <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can answer that. Me when it doesn't go right. <laughs> I think all of us are in that boat though. Mm-hmm. Well, we appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us today, Mike. Yeah, I know. It was fun. A really fun maybe, uh, conversation. Maybe I'll, I'll come back when there's some more results from the Missouri uh, study to sure. actually present to people. Yeah, well, if, you'll, if you're willing, we, we'd love to have you back for sure to, to give a follow-up. I was also going to mention, uh, just to remind people, and also uh, for you, uh, we you know, you've talked about several studies that you've, that you have published and, and some other resources. We'll try to link those things. And if there's a good way for people to, to contact you, uh, we can provide people, you know, with that information, in the show notes as well, uh, if they want to follow up or have questions or anything, but yeah, we really appreciate you taking some time to, to talk to us. It's really fun and interesting. 
I didn't yep. think we would ever get to Mako Sharks, but we did. Here we are. Here we are already. <laughs> <laughs> so now you got to find someone who can one up Mako Sharks, I guess, as a guest. So. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to think about that. <laughs> Or not, or the listeners are like, okay, that's cool, but like turkey. <laughs> what does this have to do with turkeys again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, is that all you got? That's all I got. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for, for uh, talking to us. Really good conversation. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it, Mike. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.